Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bible Basics with Pastor Steve. And we got all kinds of stuff going on for you tonight. Actually, just a couple of important things. So first off, tonight we're going to be talking about David and the Ark of the Covenant. And it finally, well, not arriving at its permanent home in Jerusalem, but finally arriving in Jerusalem. And that's going to be Samuel Lesson 22. We're going to be based on 2 Samuel chapter 6. We are doing a survey of the Bible one week at a time. And um, one week at a time, one story per week. Hello, John. Good to have you here tonight. One story per week. And I will send out the paraphrasing of the story every Tuesday afternoon. I did get today's out at a decent time. So hope you all had a chance to take a look at it. And I strongly suggest that you, yeah, I strongly suggest that you do read it ahead of time. If you have any questions about it that you want to be sure that I talk about when we have our online lesson, then please be sure to email those to me. If you get them to me in advance, I'll take a look at them before I come on live. And hello, Charles. Good to have you here. Yeah, feel please feel free to say hi and to say where you're watching from so we can have a little bit of community there in the chat section. Oh, I, that's right. Last week, um, somebody, one person said that they would like to see the chat on the screen. Hello, Barbara. Um, if you would like to see the chat in the screen, I am happy to do that. Um, I only had one person say so, though. If I, if I have a couple more people say, yes, let's do that. Well, you know what? Let's just go ahead and do it and see how we go. There we go. You can see you can see the um, you can see the chat on the screen. If you say hi, you'll you'll see all of it right there. Oh, there we go. Sorry. To... All right. So moving on. <laughs> if you don't like that, tell me and I'll take it back down again. So if you ever fall behind or if you missed any lessons, you can always catch up on YouTube or on Facebook. It's easier to find them on YouTube, I think, than it is on Facebook. And if you want to be added to the to the email that I send out each week, hello, Stella. If you want to be added to the email that I send out each week, you just email the address on the screen below my head. <laughs> Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good evening, Roseanne. All right, so tonight, like I said, we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 6, paraphrasing. Listen for the word of our Lord. David gathered 30,000 elite troops. They went to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Kiriath Jerem to Jerusalem. The Lord God of Israel sits on his throne over the cherubim on, on the Ark. The Ark was at Abinadab's house. They put it on a new ox-drawn cart. Abinadab's sons, Uzzah and Ahio, drove the cart down, from the hill, down the hill from the house. As they led the procession, David and his entourage played music with harps, tambourines, castanets, cymbals, and all kinds of instruments. They all danced for the Lord. As they were passing the threshold, the threat, excuse me, as they were th passing the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled. The cart lurched, and Uzzah grabbed hold of the ark to steady it. This angered the Lord, and the Lord struck Uzzah dead right next to the ark. This really upset David. To this day, he still refers to that area as Perez Uzzah, which means lashing out at, lashing out at Uzzah. David was so afraid of the Lord that he changed his mind about taking the ark to Jerusalem. So instead, he left it at the home of Obed-Edom the Gittite, which was nearby. The Ark of the Covenant stayed there for three months. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom's whole family the entire time it was there. When David heard that, he changed his mind again and went back to get the Ark. When David brought the Ark into a city, there was a huge celebration. Every six paces, they stopped and sacrificed an, an ox and a fatted calf. Trumpets blasted as David danced his heart out for the Lord. All he was wearing was a linen loincloth. David's first wife, the daughter of Saul, I didn't put her name in there, Michal, David's first wife, the daughter of Saul, 
watched the procession from her window when she saw David celebrating, hatred filled her heart. David had set a tent up for the ark. He put the ark in its place inside, and then he began making burnt offerings and peace offerings to God. Then he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed meat and bread and raisin cakes to all the people. After the celebration, David went home to bless his new house. Michal was there waiting for him. And she said, you put on quite a show today, dancing around half naked like a pervert in front of all the servant slave girls. You were disgusting. David responded, I was dancing for the Lord who chose me, not your father, to be king of Israel. I will praise the Lord all I want, and I will be as disgusting as I want. And all of those slave girls you're talking about will still love me. We call never had any children. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> it's quite a little last sentence there on the end of that chapter. The two of them have an argument in which David trashes her dead father, and then it says she never had any kids. So what do we have to say about this story tonight? Well, first of all, I should point out that there's a theory that um, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the lost Ark, was actually lost for a while because we have not heard of the Ark in quite some time in this story. So there's, the, there's a school of thought that it, going out and picking up the Ark wasn't just a ma simple matter of, oh, yeah, it's over at Kareth Jerem, or that, no, that they actually had to find it because it had not been used in worship in quite some time. It sort of had been put there in, in safekeeping, and maybe not everybody knew that it was there. So at any rate, he, he gets it, and he brings it back in. And if you remember from way back when we were talking about the creation of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark has carrying poles because it's supposed to be the throne of God, and the cherubim sitting on top form the back of the throne and the front of the throne, and the box itself is the seat of the throne, and it has rings on the sides and poles that go through it, just like the if you ever see in the movies or in artwork, um, kings, particularly pharaohs, didn't walk around. They sat on a throne that was carried around, and that's the idea that the people of Israel have no king, true king, other than God, and he rides around on his throne, and the people carry it around. That's how the ark is supposed to travel, by hand, touching only the poles. The rules are very specific. You don't touch the throne itself. You pick it up by the poles, and you carry it that way. There is no provision for sticking it in the back of a truck, okay? And that's the equivalent of what they've done here is they've stuck the ark in the bed of a pickup truck, and it's getting jostled around as they travel, which is one of the reasons why you're not supposed to do that. And as it gets jostled around, that's when Uzo reaches over and grabs it, and God smites him, as the Old Testament, as the King James Version says. All right. So the, the offense here is that the ark is not being handled reverently. Another thing I want to point out is I, I kind of wonder what was David's dancing like? What did it look like? Was it was it a formal dance? Was it something that people would recognize as a liturgical dance? Was that a thing back then? Or was it ecstatic dancing? The only time I've ever seen it depicted is in the movie King David starring um, Richard Gere as King David. Um not a big fan of Richard Gere myself, but um, he's done some good work. He was good in Chicago. Um, and that scene, it looks like he's kind of wearing a diaper, dancing around. It, 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 it's quite a spectacle. It's definitely an ecstatic kind of spur of the moment kind of dance. What was it like? And, and to what degree was that normal? And to what degree was it shocking to people, not just perhaps me call but other people, and we, we really don't know the answer to those questions. So what, what can we say, given all the things that we don't know? Well, it is clear that um, God expects reverence, but that reverence does not always look the way we expect it to work. So, you know, I don't, I don't know anybody 
who wasn't shocked by um, God smiting Uzzah the first time they read that story because they they think it sounds perfectly logical that you would transport um, the ark in this way, but yet God was highly offended by it. So God's understanding of the right way to handle the ark is not the same as ours. He thought that was bad. The way they were handling the ark, they thought was bad. Ox cart, bad. On the other hand, King David danced around in a loincloth is apparently just fine. Doesn't say anything at all about God thinking maybe David should have put some more clothes on or maybe dancing ecstatically in the street or however he was dancing um, was perhaps uh, lacking in decorum, as we would say. And and decorum is, is you know, so decorum is kind of a human thing, I guess. Well, I guess or, or at least we should say that God has his own sense of decorum and we have our own sense of decorum because, okay, so in this story, Putting the, ox, putting the ox in the back of the pickup is bad. Dancing half naked in front of the ark is good. Okay. Those are very counterintuitive from a human perspective. Both of them are. Okay. So we don't, un, so, you know, we make a big deal about decorum in church. And it, I've got my own ideas about decorum in church. But, you know, are, are they really gods or are they culturally bound? You know, the whole thing about taking off hats. In the sanctuary, well, that's very much an American Christian idea. There are lots of traditions in which hats are required in church. Certainly, they're required in Judaism, right? Um, you know, we got ideas about that. We got ideas about what's a proper, appropriate clothing for church. You know, you all know that I like to dress up in church. I want to wear my best. I want to look my best. That's how I honor God. But that's that's it's just that. It's how I honor God. My, my son wears jeans and a t-shirt to church pretty much every week. And we walk in, you know, together, usually for the eight o'clock service. And he towers over me now and he's got the big wild hair and the t-shirt, the, the, the faded t-shirt and the faded jeans. And I'm there in my, uh, in my, um, in my coat and hat. Uh, and, um, I, I, we're, we're each honoring God in our own way. Does God have a preference? Well, if God does have a preference on that, and I think this story is saying he does, it's also saying that we don't know what it is. And when we make determines about it, they're not as scripturally bound as we thought they were, because if David knew his law, he'd have known not to stick it in the back of the truck. What does this story tell us about ourselves? Well, that we don't read the situation well. I mean, it. All right, so David thought he was handling the ark appropriately, but clearly he wasn't. Um, Michal thought that David's dancing was disgusting, but we don't know that it was. She thought that it was. You know, was she being objective? Was this really outside of cultural norms? Or is Michal just angry because of what David has just put her through? So in case you've forgotten, because it's been a little while now, Michal was David's first wife. She was King Saul's daughter, and um, it was a big deal that he was married to Saul's daughter when he did. And when Saul went crazy and decided that David had to die, David had to go on the run, and Michal actually helped him escape. And so, um, so yeah, he, he left her, and she helped him leave because he had to flee to get away before Saul had him killed. Now, that does ultimately mean spousal abandonment because he was gone for a long time. For years, he's gone. His marriage with Michal is effectively over. Saul gave her to somebody else to marry. And so when Saul finally died and when David became king, um, she'd been married to this other guy for years. But David considered her to still be his wife. So he he had been... And, sent men to get her and bring her back. And then, and her husband was, her new husband was so upset. He, he followed them crying for miles until they finally told him, you know, we're, we're getting close to where David is now. You better make yourself scarce. And he finally turned around and went home. It's a very sad story. We, we, we don't actually, in that portion of the story, Michal doesn't say anything. So we don't know what her opinion on this is, but I'm reading it from, from this story here. 
that she um, had a good life with her second husband and did not need to come back. And um, Barry has said hi. Hello, Barry. Um, so I'm thinking she did not want to go to Jerusalem. I'm thinking she did not want to be married to David anymore. And then when she saw this, it just put her over the edge. <laughs> okay, so Jer Jerry says um, hello and good evening. And he wants us to know that he did not forget where the church is. <laughs> I know you didn't, but I would love to see you again in the pew sometime soon. But we're glad to have you online, too. So, my point is, if Michal is angry at David, that could be influencing her judgment when it comes to David's behavior. And, of course, we all do that. We all do that, okay? So, for example... Parents with kids. I, I, I've been saying for years, based on stuff I read when I was in college in my Psych 100 class, which of course makes me an expert on child rearing, um, that um, the most important thing about children with discipline is consistency, that the kids need to know what the rules are. They need to know what the penalties for breaking the rules are. They need to be consistently applied so that the kids have consistency and predictability that they know if I do this, then this is what's going to happen. And that the way that plays out is going to be based entirely on what they did and what covenant they broke, not on the mood of the person who's inflicting punishments that day. And um, I, I felt that I had a growing up, I, I had, I had a lot of consistency on that. A very good understanding of, of what I could get away with and what I couldn't and what my parents would react to and what they did not. And my parents did a very good job of being consistent. Whereas I knew other people who had no consistency at all. There were days when they could get away with absolute murder. And there were days when, um, if, if, if they, uh, if they made too much noise in the kitchen, all heck would break loose in the house. And it had nothing to do with what the rules were. It had everything to do with how bad a day at work one of the parents had had. And, and, and those kids had issues. Those kids had problems. You know, they, they didn't do well. Um, and the thing is, um, all parents think they're predictable. You know, you know I, I, I've told this story to my kids and they say, well, I, I hope you don't think you're that consistent, Dad. <laughs> They said, they said, you might be more consistent than some parents, but if you don't think that the mood you're in affects um, how you react to situations, you're wrong. Your mood does affect the way you react. And, you know, and I listen to that. They're, they're probably right. Um, of course, the mood they're in affects the way they perceive my reactions as well. I'm not ignorant of that either. But my point is this happens in church as well. So somebody does something in church. Maybe they wear something to church. Maybe they say something in church. Maybe they use a certain kind of language. And it might not bother some people, but it really upsets other people. Okay. And why is it upsetting them? Is it upsetting them because um, they've always thought that this behavior was wrong? Why did they always think this behavior was wrong? Is it really wrong or are they just in a really bad mood this day and they, and they didn't have as much patience or is it because they already had negative feelings about this person already? And, and maybe if this person had done it, it would have been just fine. But if this person did it, that's unacceptable. See, that's how we are. That's how we are in church. We need to be self-aware. We need to be, we need to be more critical of our own reactions. We don't, we should be more critical of our own reactions than we are of other people's actions. There, I think I said that right. All right, so what does this story tell us about our relationships with God and with each other? Well, let's see. I, I think I already covered most of this, actually. Um, was Did David do the right thing in reclaiming his wife? Okay. Um, I wish I knew more about the norms of divorce around then. Um, 
I, I know enough to know that divorce was the male's prerogative, not the female's prerogative. But I, I don't really understand. I don't know whether or not her second marriage was legally binding. Seems to me it would have been under the circumstances, but I don't really know that. And certainly David's the king, so he kind of decides what's legally binding and what's not. Um, what we do know is that from this point forward, David and Michal never had a relationship. So what's the point in keeping her in Jerusalem other than pride? Because we don't want the king's ex-wife out there um, living with somebody else. Yeah. To what degree does pride make its way into the decisions that we make? How often do we think that we're doing the Christian thing when really we're just defending our pride or our ego or whatever? Hmm. So that's all I have for you tonight when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant. A couple of other things I'll talk about real quick. Um, right now we have wrapping up upstairs in room 205, the servant or sucker series. So what, what, um, is, what that is, servant or sucker is a DVD, um, curriculum and the, um, the person who created it has given, um, broad permission for people to adapt it in any way they want to. And, um, it's a DVD curriculum. I'm not sure it's still in print. I think it is, but I'm not sure. It's, it's not available to stream on any services. So you'd have to find a copy of the DVD. Um, it, 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 the, the curriculum was put together by a pastor down south who um, worked in, in a community where there's a lot of needs, like the community that we have here in downtown Hagerstown and like folks have in some parts of D.C. and like folks have in many parts of Baltimore City. You've got homeless, you've got addicts, you've got panhandlers. And um, what and, and the, the question driving the DVD is, what is the compassionate thing to do when you see need? Should you uncritically give people what they ask for? Or should you do nothing? And is there is there is there a third option or a fourth option? So the, so we're we're doing the curriculum, but we're adding into that. When I say we, by the way, it's not just us. Cindy Brown um, from our congregation and Jeannie Asbury, who is the executive director of Reach of Washington County, which is um, not just a cold weather shelter, but also a day resource center, and um, it seems like they do more stuff all the time, and putting together. An education, ed, educating people as to what the what the needs are in the community, but also what the resources are in the community, and what in fact is the best way to help people. So here in downtown Hagerstown, we have signs at all the places, and when I say signs, I mean the city has erected signs uh, at the intersections where people tend to panhandle, are saying, um, "Change the way you give. Panhandling is dangerous." Um, before you decide to, to give money to somebody, um, think about supporting the homeless in some other way. And, um, and, and that, that's, that is an important question. There are far more resources in downtown Hagerstown than people realize. Um, and this is important because addiction is such a big problem and because it impacts so many people. So for example, I learned this the hard way. Um, in my very first congregation, um, we had a um, teenage girl who clearly had issues. Um, young teenage girl, like 13, um, who was, we'll say, precocious. And um, and she was in and out of the church by herself. You know, she'd, she'd show up for youth stuff, sometimes for Sunday school. Um, parents were not bringing her. She was showing up on her own, which is, you know, always kind of, you know, you, you notice these things. And um, one, I, the, the day I met her father was a Friday evening. Um, I lived in a parsonage that was located right next to the church, Baltimore City, um, near public housing, near a train depot. 
And um, this guy knocked on the door and I opened the door and he introduced himself and he said, I'm so-and-so's father. I immediately knew who he was talking about. Oh, good to meet you. And he began to tell me a story that I've had heard before and I've heard since, which is that my car just broke down. It's right around the corner. I need to get it off the road and preferably to a shop. If not to the shop, at least get it to my driveway. I've got a tow truck driver waiting there by the car. I've got most of the money I need to cover, but I'm 20 bucks shy. Can you see to give me 20 bucks? And here I've got my daughter's bicycle with me for collateral. I'll, I'll leave her bicycle here and you can hold on to it until I come back with your money. Nice. Being a 25, 26 year old guy, I said, oh, oh, I, I'm not taking your daughter's bicycle for collateral. And, and I gave him the 20 bucks. Okay, because I kind of knew who he was. Um, and I knew that it, yeah, like I said, I've, I've heard the I need a tow story many times. In fact, back in my hometown, which was a suburban middle class neighborhood, there was a guy um, in the parking lot of the liquor store uh, near my house. Every Friday, after, every Friday evening, he was there um, trying to get 20 bucks to get a tow for his car. And he always said, I work for the Army Corps of Engineers. My car is stranded on Central Avenue. I need 20 bucks to get the tow because it's blocking traffic, yada, yada. Every Friday night, this guy was doing that. Hit us several times. Um, so I'd heard the tow story before, but I figured, you know, all right, good chance he's lying. But, you know, that's on him, right? If he's lying, that's his sin, not mine. I gave him the 20 bucks told him to take his bike back to his daughter on the way to the road. Next day, a guy comes to the door Saturday morning. This guy, I don't know. He knocks on the door and he says, Hey, you don't know me, but I live next door to such and such family. I believe the, the father was here last night. I said, yes. As a matter of fact, he was. Why? And he says, and you gave him $20, didn't you? And I said, yes. And he says, well, what you need to know is that when you do that, he spends it on alcohol and he's an angry drunk. Every time somebody gives him 20 bucks, he comes home, he beats his wife and he beats his kids. And that's what happened last night. And I had to listen to it because you gave him 20 bucks. Please don't do that again. So was that on me? Or was that on him? Well, you could argue the first time it was on me, except for that a voice in the back of my head said, you probably shouldn't do this. But I let guilt get the better of me. And I so I don't give out cash anymore. Um, in that particular community, I took somebody all the way to the train station one day because his story was he needed a ticket to go back down south to home because he had given up on Baltimore. I said, all right, I'll get you a train ticket. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. I'll, I'll just, just give me the money. Like, oh, it's, it's, it's no problem at all. You know, the, the train station's about a mile from here. I'd be happy to give you a ride. Come on, get in the car. And the guy got in the car with me. Yeah, I took, yeah, I let him get in my car. And I took him to the car. I took him to the train station, got all the way up to the counter. Um, and and um, the, the guy turned around and walked out of the station. He didn't want, he, he needed money for, Something else, something illegal. So I would discourage giving cash to panhandlers. And the great thing about here in Hagerstown is I got a stack of these. I got two things in my car door. One is a stack of these, and the other is a package of Narcan. <laughs> um, haven't ever had to use the Narcan, but... Um, but I, but I know there are people in the church who have used Narcan, so I'm ready. I'm sure my day will come. I got the Narcan, and I got this. And this is a list of all the different resources that are in Hagerstown and um, how, to, how to find them, how to reach them. And, and um, it's got a list of all the shelters, all the support centers, all the different places, the meals and soup kitchens. Uh, every day of the week in downtown Hagerstown, there is a place to get a free hot meal. Many days more than once. So when somebody says that they haven't eaten in days, 
if they're not new to the Hagers, if if they've been in the Hagerstown homeless community any length of time, that's simply not true. They know where to get food, and it's not like the old days. We call them soup kitchens. They're not soup kitchens. It's not like the old days. We feed people. You know, we don't just give people um, mush. You know, we 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 feed them pretty decent. Um, I mean, everybody I know who works at a soup kitchen is more than happy to eat the food that they serve to others at the soup kitchen. It's fine. Um, so there's that. There's hotlines to find whatever you need. And um, that is what I give to people. If, if you must give, if, 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 you, if your conscience just won't let you refrain from giving money, although I would encourage you to refrain from giving money, at least give it to them with this. Because here's the thing. If you're not going to give money, that doesn't absolve you for responsibility, okay? Because usually this is somebody who needs to be in, in treatment or at a bare minimum harm reduction, okay? Because um, So panhandling can be a doorway to harm reduction, or I should say a gateway. Panhandling can be a gateway to harm reduction, and harm reduction can be a gateway to recovery, and recovery can be a gateway to a whole bunch of other services, and as Christians, we can't just ignore what's going on. Now, if you want to ignore the panhandler because it's not safe and it's an intersection or whatever, that I totally understand, especially if they're the aggressive um, squeegee guys in Baltimore. But you can't ignore the problem entirely. You, you know, there's a zillion ways to deal productively with the problem. And, um, and in fact, there are phone numbers on this list you can call and say, Hey, um, you know, there, there's homeless intervention folks. Um, and they're limited in what they can do. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. You, you can call, uh, what, what's the one I want people to know about? Um, if you're in Hagerstown, Potomac community services, um, um, I'm sorry, Potomac Case Management. You can call Potomac Case Management and ask to speak to the um, homeless response team. I told them, hey, there's a person panhandling at the corner of such and such and such and such, and it do doesn't look like a safe situation. It would be great if somebody checked in on them. Now, they don't... What they're limited in is if the person doesn't want to talk to them, they got to leave. They, in fact, they're required to ask for permission before they can come within a certain distance of them. But um, there's stuff that you can do. So I'm not saying don't help. I'm saying be wise. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about, uh, so this for those of you in the Hagerstown area, this was part one of a six-week program, okay? And it's going to be a good program every week. I kind of... I had to leave to come and do this just when the guy from the from the housing authority was getting ready to speak. And I kind of wanted to hear what he had to say. So I sad that I missed that. I'm going to miss the last speaker each night, but that's okay. I'm happy to be here with you guys. But if you are in the Hagerstown area, I'd encourage you to, to participate in this program and, and watch this video the next day on reruns. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about is Otterbein. United Methodist Church in the month of May is going to be voting on whether or not to join the Reconciling Ministries Network, which is the Methodist network of congregations that has decided to openly welcome and affirm um, the gay community, whether the denomination decides to do that or not. And um, we had a straw poll on this back in November. I shouldn't say November. Back in the fall at some point. I'm not sure what month it was. Back in the fall, we had a straw, straw poll and the folks who were present that day, it was overwhelmingly in favor of joining, 89%. Um, we're moving in on, on in May, on three Sundays in May, we're, we're going to, by paper ballot, we're going to vote on this. And um, the thing that I, that I want to mention is that it's come to my attention that there are folks who um, are no longer active in this congregation, are still members, but are no longer active have not been attending for years or participating in any way and are not only intending to show up to vote against this, but are actively recruiting others to kind of stuff the ballot, um, the ballot box. And um, that really saddens me. 
Um, there's some other emotions I could tag on to that if I wanted to, but I'm going to try and be charitable right now. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. I mean, this is a vote for the that affects the future of our congregation, and um, and the people who should be voting are people who intend to be present for the future of our congregation. It's unethical to cast a vote that affects somebody else. It doesn't affect you at all. I remember back when I was in Baltimore, my very first church, um, we were ha- it was election time, and I was waiting in line to vote at, um, at uh, my polling place, and there was a woman there wanting to vote, and her address was wrong. She had a county address. Um, and she had never registered to vote. What had happened was, and I don't remember how they found this, but they didn't have her on their files. And the reason was because she had moved out of the city and into the county, but she had never registered to vote in the county. So she wanted to come back and vote in the city. And she wanted to do this because um, A, she wanted to vote, and B, it was, it, was, it was a year that there was a lot on the ballot, okay? We were voting for senators and presidents and a new mayor for the city of Baltimore. Okay. And she couldn't believe that they weren't going to let her vote on the new mayor just because she lived in the county. In what system of ethics is it, is it okay to vote for somebody else's mayor? (laughs) Um, and in her mind, this was this was entirely righteous, and and she was not even willing to entertain the notion that perhaps it was inappropriate for her to be there trying to vote. And um, that's kind of how I feel about this. So, if you have any influence over any of these individuals who are long gone from our congregation, and yet still want to have something to say about how we move forward. Please try to exercise some of that influence over them. That's it for the news. It's all local news this week. So until next week, don't forget to email me any questions you've got. Moving forward with David's story um, next week. And um, interesting things in the life of David. Oh, Jerry says something. Also, most panhandlers in Hagerstown are scam artists, especially ones that sit outside shopping centers. Uh, I guess it depends on how you define scam artists. I'm a, I'd say most of them have active addictions. Um, so if, if it's a scam and they're not going to use the money on what they say they're going to use the money on. Um, and, and, and we need to be sympathetic to these people because... Um, yeah, no, nobody when they were in elementary school said, I, I hope to someday be a, be a heroin addict begging for money outside of, outside of Aldi's, you know. So we need to feel some sympathy that their life has taken this turn, but we also need to help them make better choices. We can't force them to make better choices, but we can give them opportunities. And not everybody is personally equipped to have that conversation with a homeless person. I'm not encouraging everybody to do that. But if you're not going to do that, then how are you going to help the situation? Because you can't just ignore it. Um, Anyway, and I do feel for some of these folks. I've had people come up to me just recently. Hey, it's my birthday and I haven't eaten anything all day. And the guy's got sores all over his face from, from scratching. And that, that's an addict thing, you know? And, um, and I gave him, I gave him the thing. I said, "Here, this is where you can get some food." He took it. Anyway, um, that's it. So we'll see you in the coming weeks, either in church or online. Don't forget to email me any questions you have, and um, I won't use your name unless you so say it's okay to do that. Oh, and um, I see Barbara has chimed in. Thank you for your honesty and your integrity. Thank you. I appreciate your support. I really do. Um, and everybody out there who um, who um, 
is paying attention to this. If there's anything you can do to make our congregation's path forward go more smoothly, please do that. Um, especially if you hear misinformation going around, just shut it down and say, that isn't true. Don't say that. All right. Let us pray. God, give me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, the courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. All right, folks. Thank y'all, and God bless.